Conversations for Health, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based cutting-edge research, and practical tips. Our mission is to empower you with knowledge, debunk myths, and provide you with clinical insights. This podcast is provided as an educational resource for healthcare practitioners only. This podcast represents the views and opinions of the host and their guests and does not represent the views or opinions of Designs for Health, Inc. This podcast does not constitute medical advice. The statements contained in this podcast have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products mentioned are not intended to diagnose treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, let's embark on a journey towards optimal well-being, one conversation at a time. Here's your host, Evelyn Lambrecht. Welcome to Conversations for Health. I'm your host, Evelyn Lambrecht, and today I'm joined by Dr. David Brady. Welcome, Dr. Brady. Thank you. Dr. David Brady is a naturopathic and functional medicine doctor. He is the chief medical officer at Designs for Health and Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory, and he is a professor emeritus and director of the Nutrition Institute at the University of Bridgeport. There you go. You got it. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's a mouthful, I know. It is a mouthful. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be talking about long-haul COVID, hot topic, a lot of people are suffering. What is long-haul COVID syndrome? I know there are multiple names for it. And what is the prevalence in the U.S.? Yeah, um, good questions. Uh, The data, you know, we're getting new data all the time and the picture is not getting better looking. (laughs) Unfortunately, it's getting worse. But uh, long-haul COVID syndrome, or sometimes just called long-haul syndrome, sometimes called PASC, P-A-S-C, which is sort of the more the medical uh, terminology for it. But uh, it's basically people who had acute COVID. So they had an infection with from SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they had all of the, usually all of the typical acute symptoms, you know, more like a respiratory kind of flu type of illness. Um, but when they recovered from the acute phase of it, and mo- by and large, most of the respiratory classic symptoms of acute COVID resolved, not everything resolved. They ended up with persistent symptoms that just never quite went away. Um, And that symptom list is pretty long, but the most prevalent things would be fatigue, particularly post-exertional fatigue, Um, pain, ongoing kind of weird pain, Um, pain that um, is hard to typify. You know, it's not necessarily just in the joint. It's not necessarily just in the muscles. It's kind of uh, kind of a vague, achy pain, often um, around the rib cage, like a costochondritis type of weird pain, chest pain. Um, often they have elements of what we call POTS syndrome, post- postural orthostatic um, um, tachycardia or hypotension, where they get a rapid heartbeat or tachycardia intermittently for no specific reason, not just because they're exerting themselves, just sort of out of the blue, often in the evening. So there seems to be a temporal uh, component to it. They often will get dizzy when they stand up quick, like a postural hypotension. Um, And a myriad of other symptoms are common, Uh, weird neurological phenomena, almost like a neuropathy or a kind of a, uh, a buzzing or a pain in the distal extremities. Um, also part of that POTS syndrome is like a Renaud's phenomena where all of a sudden their hands and feet go ice cold um, for no reason. Again, no rhyme or reason to it at all. Um, brain fog, certainly a big part of it. And then there's a whole laundry list of potential symptoms that are not as prevalent, like persistent minor cough, shortness of breath. But those things are not as uh, common in the vast majority of long haul syndrome patients. And what is the prevalence right now? Like, do we know how many people who have had COVID develop symptoms? Or de- well, the Brookings Institute did a uh, a study of this within the last twelve months, and they put the number in the United States at about sixteen million people wow. with long haul COVID or persistent symptoms as a sequela to having SARS CoV two infection, and of those sixteen million. About 4 million are in prime age working years. So that's a big impact on the economy, uh, which is less people in the workforce, but also people not only not in the workforce, but 
then consuming a lot of healthcare resources, maybe being on public assistance. So it's a big, big financial impact um, to the country. And of course, it's it's not isolated to the United States. When you run those numbers globally, they're massive. Right. So in 2020, long haul COVID was not well understood, though patients were sharing that they had these symptoms, which were not unlike long haul symptoms of other viral infections. How have things changed now, three years later? Uh, well, a lot has changed. We understand a lot more about long haul syndrome, although we still have not unlocked some of the major questions that still persist. But you know, this is not the first time we've had long-term sequela or people have gone on to have chronic illness after an acute pathogenic infection and predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly post-viral infections. There was reports of similar phenomena uh, way back even in the early 20th century with some of the viral outbreaks that mm -hmm. had happened, influenza and Spanish flu and things like that. Um, and then the latest um, kind of parallel or uh, analogous situation to it was about 20 years ago or so we had SARS-1. And SARS-1 luckily um, did not it was not nearly as transmissible. Uh, it was more severe, actually, and more deadly, but it was not as transmissible. So there, there was not nearly as many people affected. But of the people who were affected, and particularly those who were hospitalized, many of the healthcare workers who cared for those patients came down with post-viral myalgia, post-viral fatigue. And at the time, you know, they're usually just labeled as chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS-ME. Um, which, by the way, is a post-viral syndrome in and of itself. That's just a much broader uh, blanket term for people who have uh, a post-infectious syndrome um, from a multitude of potential viruses or pathogens. Um, classic fibromyalgia is another example of a disorder that has all the hallmarks of a post-viral sequela. Um, but this long-haul syndrome with SARS-CoV-2 has been impacted way more people because the, the virus was just so transmissible and it affected so many people that uh, when you get a percentage of them that go on to develop long-term chronic symptoms, those numbers end up being very, very large. Um, we do know a lot of things about it. We still do not know a lot of things about it, but the, it's interesting that that first viral wave, that spring of 2020, seem to be the worst from the standpoint of causing long haul syndrome. It's not that later variants like Omicron and Delta did not cause any long haul, but it does not seem that they caused as much long haul or as severe persistent long haul syndrome as that first wave of the virus did, unfortunately. Yeah, and especially with the respiratory symptoms. Yeah. What are the current major gaps in the standards of clinical care? And I have some thoughts on this because I know at various hospitals, like where I am, they have created long haul COVID clinics, but clinicians are still working in isolation. So yeah. if you have this symptom, you go see this doctor. If you have lung symptoms, you go see the pulmonologist and then yeah. they don't talk to each other. So... Yeah, I, I don't see it as there is really a standard of care established at this point for long haul syndrome, um, either in conventional medicine or in complementary or integrative mm. medicine. Um, I think a lot of people are trying a lot of things um, that seem to make sense, even if it's uh, through, you know, rational hypothesis, but not yet necessarily hard core outcome data. And people are trying to do the right thing, but there's no, there's been no coalescence around a gold standard of care. Um, you're right. Um, in conventional medicine models, it's a highly fragmented specialist kind of dominated um, architecture of the medical system. So you tend to get routed to whatever specialist your symptoms tend to line up with. The problem with long haul COVID syndrome is there's so many symptoms. What specialist do you send them to? You, you know, because you can send them to a pulmonologist, you can send them to an endocrinologist, you can send them to uh, all these other types of specialists, a gastroenterologist, many of them, um, and they're gonna they're gonna treat it through their kind of myopic tunnel vision of their specialty. And this really is a very complex condition that I think needs the type of healthcare provider that can look at it from a much more global holistic perspective and have enough understanding and skills in those different domains to be able to um, do
do the right thing. And I, therefore, I really do think that, you know, highly qualified, very high-end integrative functional medicine physicians may be the perfect kind of captain of, of, of someone's healthcare journey to help them when they have long haul COVID. doesn't mean you would not have to utilize some other specialist um, at times, but you really do have to look at it with a, with a larger, through a larger, wider lens. Right. And look at all the root causes and how everything Correct. ties yes. together. You said earlier that we still have so many unanswered questions around yeah. long haul syndrome. I'd love to know what some of those are. And do we understand the pathogenesis right now of long haul <laughs> COVID? Uh, no, not really. I okay. mean, there's a lot of hypotheses, but but there's no absolute proof. Um, even at the fundamental level, well, we know this is a downstream sequela of, at one point, having an acute infection with SARS-CoV-2, right? And we know a lot about how SARS-CoV-2 acts and how it gets into tissues and some of the sinister things it does in the microvasculature and microclotting and, all, and how it affects mitochondrial function and all these other things. But we still have not answered the fundamental question of what creates this persistence uh, of symptoms in this virus that has supposedly resolved from its acute phase. So is it some reservoir in the body of actually replicatable virus, right? Can the virus, is it living deep in tissues and replicating itself? Um, some people believe that's the case, although it's not proven. We, we've seen reservoirs of virus persist for a long time, for, for instance, in the gastrointestinal tract and in the enterocyte shedding spike protein. Or is it just somehow the virus program their own cells machinery to make spike protein and other proteins that key the immune response again? Or is it that the original viral infection caused a dysregulation or an imbalance in the immune response that persists? So kind of it pushed the immune system into a hyperactive frenzied state that got stuck in a locked loop pattern, even without more virus being there. Um, I'm not sure any of those are incorrect. I think they mm -hmm. all could kind of be in play and they may not all be in play in every subject. Right. There's variations, there's shades of gray to long haul COVID. And, uh, but fundamentally that is a question that ultimately does ideally need to be answered. But as far as the mechanisms of how, which, whatever those three things I said are true, how then does the, how is the dirty work done in the tissues and how does it make people feel the way they do? Um, we know some about that, but there's still definitely missing, there's gaps in our understanding of it for sure. Right. Very interesting. I want to talk about the links and associations between long haul and things like immunological cytokine patterns. And actually, I remember from our Cassie talk when Bruce Patterson spoke, yeah. he talked about the different metabolomic signatures mm -hmm. um, in long haulers, whether it was, you know, post-infection or whether they had underlying EBV. Can you talk more about those different presentations? Yeah, Dr. Patterson has done some interesting work. You know, he's been one of the more active um, researchers and clinicians in this space from the beginning. Most of his work is centered more around cytokine signatures than metabolomic, okay. and, uh, wider metabolomic patterns. But, uh, you know, he, he has found some interesting things. I mean, his background started uh, in HIV. So he was very versed in how viruses do their dirty work, you know, especially very complicated uh, viruses that have persistence. And uh, he noticed, for instance, early on when he was doing cytokine uh, testing, that a certain cytokine called um, CCL5, or RANTES, it's called as well, tended to be elevated in these long-haul syndrome patients. And that's the case in HIV as well. So that was the genesis of why they tried some of the therapeutics they did. Hmm. Um, for instance, uh, a antiviral drug known as Maraviroc, or Celzentri, I think is the trade name. It's, in a, it's used in HIV cocktails because it it, um, it pushes down CCL5. It's a CCL5 inhibitor. So they use that to see, hey, if we, we see this cytokine that's inflammatory high, if we can use an agent to push that cytokine down, do the patients feel better? Oftentimes that doesn't work out the way you would hope it was, right? Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're basically 
and, and I understand why this happened because we were just trying to look for anything and people were trying to look for anything. So if you see atypical patterns on testing like cytokine testing, hey, do we have any agents that can normalize that pattern? And maybe if we normalize those cytokines, the patient normalizes. It doesn't always work out as clean and linear as that, right? It's complicated. There's, there's more to it than one cytokine or even a couple of cytokines. But he did find specific patterns when they used machine learning and things to kind of mine a lot of tests being done on long haulers who got long haul from the virus, on people who had persistent symptoms, let's say after an immunization for COVID. And he also looked at other um, subjects that had long-term fatigue and myalgia. So chronic fatiguers, fibromyalgia, you want to know what's, everyone wants to know what's different between them mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the chronic fatiguers that had it long before COVID was around and, and long haul syndrome patients. And you see things that you would expect in any immune activation syndrome that involves tissue inflammation. So things like IL-6 and IL-10 and TNF-alpha, um, interferon gamma, these are all commonly high, um, but not absolutely predictably high mm -hmm. in every long haul patient. And actually other follow-up work done by other researchers really show that while some of those classic markers of inflammation that we look at, like on the cytokine pattern, were higher to some degree than in quote normal patients, there were other ones that popped out more. Um, particularly interferon beta, um, which is interesting, and interferon uh, delta. Hmm. So most people look at interfer gamma. interferon gamma yeah. and TNF alpha. So these other ones were popping out, um, and uh, cortisol actually was one that popped out. And then there are other certainly patterns in metabolomics that we see, mostly the, the um, byproduct of, of disrupted energy metabolism and mitochondrial function that would wanna, be predictable. I want to go back for one second with cortisol. What specifically are you seeing? Well, um, elevated cortisols were found in most of the early research. Now, if you follow these people long-term, sometimes they will follow that typical pattern of early elevated cortisol, and then long-term they, they will go down mm -hmm. into a low cortisol state when their adrenal reserves are exhausted. Like you see classically in a uh, chronic fatigue ME patient, that's chronic, like way years out, they will often tend to have low cortisol and low adrenal reserve. So, And yeah. then in the metabolomics, what patterns are you seeing within Krebs cycle and other metabolites? A multitude of them, but probably the, the, um, the most predictable one and the most researched one by a couple of different groups showing this same pattern is that the long haul subjects tend to they leave or abandon fatty acid beta oxidation very early and they go into carbohydrate metabolism mm. and they tend to be locked into an anaerobic dominant carbohydrate energy production. So what that means is they generate a lot of lactic acid and they don't complete the task. Like they don't get glucose down to pyruvate and then down to acetyl-CoA and down through Krebs cycle using oxygen and make lots of ATP they kind of get stuck in that more anaerobic dominant Cori cycle. They make a lot of lactic acid, which is an acidic waste product and makes the muscles achy. And then when you're in that metabolism, you're not making as much ATP. You're particularly fatigued, particularly on exertion. So post-exertional fatigue, usually you see high lactic, lactate. Um, and brain fog is classic in that. And those are two hallmark symptoms of long haul syndrome. So there's definitely mitochondrial energy metabolism dysfunction that you see, but that doesn't mean that that's the cause of long haul syndrome. It's a downstream right. effect of it. There's bigger, there's bigger things at play, but that's a big part of why the people feel the way they do. Yeah. Have you noticed in your work with patients that when you do the metabolomics and or the cytokine panels before and after whatever you're using, which we'll get into, mm -hmm. that you do see those things resolve? You can see changes. The problem is the same things that change it in one patient don't always change it mm. in another. It's not like a very linear, oh, we got this wired now. We will, you'll see this, 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 and this marker high 95% of the time in a long haul patient, you just give them this, this, and this, and they get better. 
Right. It's just not behaving like that. It's yeah. very elusive. And I think with a lot of complex chronic disorders, the the body's dysfunction can almost, you know, a jig and jag around, like they, it can run a solemn course around what you're trying to do to mitigate the problem. And, you know, you it's almost like you plug this hole in the dike and another one pops right. open, right? It's like playing whack-a-mole sometimes. Metabolic whack-a-mole is what we call it. So, you know, you'll you'll re seemingly repair certain certain elements of their metabolism or biochemistry, and you may get incremental improvements in symptoms, but sometimes those improvements can prove fleeting. Hmm. Like there's an atrophy of the effect of the therapy, and then they end up back in a flare or a crash. And we don't fully understand why that happens. Can it could it be that they're getting more pressure into the system by being exposed to another pathogen of some sort. You know, we're all being exposed to right. viruses and bacteria and fungi and all these different things all the time, particularly if we're traveling or getting on an airplane and things like that. And we suppress them and we don't even know what's happening in the background. Long haul patients aren't so fortunate anymore. They get any kind of pathogenic load, microbial load. It seems to just flare up this whole bird's nest of metabolic dysfunction and they go into a flare and they feel a lot worse. So they're very fragile from an immune and a metabolic standpoint because of this chaos that's going on um, in their body, which is a complicated thing because it really involves a lot of things, uh, including micro microvasculature dysfunction and inflammation and, and um, perfusion difficulties. I mean, it gets to the heart and the core of metabolism, really. And they've got some serious problems mm -hmm. in it. I have so many questions popping in my head while you're talking. Since we were talking about lab testing, have you found any correlations or has there been research on correlations between certain genetic SNPs and a propensity toward developing long haul COVID? That's a good question. There's a lot of people doing a lot of metadata mining on different, um, you know, SNP patterns or different genomic patterns in general on long haul patients versus patients who didn't develop long haul or, you know, similar things were being done on trying to find how could we genetically somehow predict people who, when they get acute COVID would go down the really bad path to acute respiratory distress syndrome and need, you know, into the ICU and potential catastrophic outcome. We definitely noticed patterns um, in different genetic lines. Uh, for instance, you saw what happened in early in the pandemic in Bergamo, Italy, um, devastating to that whole region. And they have a very, uh, a pretty clean genetic pool. In other words, they're mostly of Italian uh, descent on both sides of the family. There's exceptions to this, but generally much more so than the United States, which was, it's much more of a mixed bag genetically at this point. They were pretty solidly um, of one genetic line. And uh, even though they tended to smoke a lot, they also walked a lot. They weren't obese. They, you know, ate, ate generally good foods, but they had devastating outcomes. It ripped through there and, and killed a lot of people. And we saw that translate into uh, people of Italian heritage having more problems, whole families being wiped out, for instance, even in those who had immigrated to the United States. And what's different about the genes that, and their immune response that maybe made that happen? I still have yet to see definitive answers on what those were. It's complicated. I mean, there's yeah. lots of genes, lots of SNPs, and complicated patterning to try to figure out. I think at some point we'll, we'll know more about that. But I think just anybody that had genetic propensity toward a baseline mitochondrial function, energy production that was less than optimal, um, immune, you know, people who are more susceptible to immune dysregulation. So people with autoimmune type of genetics and autoimmune HLA patterns and things like that, I think are more susceptible to um, this type of uh, immune insult from a, from a virus than triggering inflammation and autoimmune phenomena in the body. Because we definitely see autoimmune phenomena as a result of this viral um, infection, particularly in certain genetically susceptible people. Very interesting. You've brought up mitochondrial dysfunction, I think twice now. I want to talk about that connection between long-haul COVID and mitochondrial dysfunction. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a common hallmark of all these post-viral syndromes, that there seems to be wreckage that happens in mitochondrial function and energy production of ATP. And, you know, it's complicated biochemistry for anyone who remembers studying it and the nightmares of trying to remember all those <laughs> uh, intermediates and enzymes and cofactors. And unfortunately, most doctors took the exam and then promptly went out on a bender that night and forgot it all and never to visit it again. Um, but in functional integrative medicine, we don't have that luxury. And in clinical nutrition, we, li we live in those pathways all the time. And uh, we definitely see dysfunction there, like we talked about on metabolomics, and we can see it. We can see that down in the really efficient energy payoff metabolism that's oxygen dependent in Krebs cycle and within the mitochondria itself, uh, we get a lot of stacking up of those intermediates, and ultimately it's because they're, they're not getting much past the anaerobic metabolism that happens outside the mitochondria. So you see these high pyruvate levels and lactic acid levels, and that's just not an efficient way to make energy. You can make enough to survive. You can't make enough to feel good and have good energy. And, and that's what everyone goes into if you overexert yourself. Like if you go out and run sprints and you're not used to it, you're, you're going to go into... When, you go into oxygen debt and you're, you know, you're going into that anaerobic metabolism, you'll build up lactic acid and you'll feel it in your muscles for a few days, right? Uh, and you, you may even feel fatigued for a few days, but these people live in that place. They, mm -hmm. they don't just go there when you do something you're not used to doing and you're not conditioned to do. They're kind of getting by on that metabolism and there's a price to pay for that. All these acidic waste products make your, all your tissues ache. Um, you're not making a lot of ATP, so you're tired and you got brain fog. And ATP is the currency of energy in the body. It's needed to make everything work. And part of that is an element that doesn't involve the mitochondria directly, but indirectly. And that is you have, in order for the mitochondria to make energy well, even if all that biochemistry was perfectly capable of working well, you have to signal it to go at the right pace. That involves thyroid function. Oftentimes these people end up with thyroid dysfunction and in a hypothyroid state or in an autoimmune induced hypothyroid state. But the other thing you must do is you must deliver oxygen to the tissues. It's like a bellows on a fire, right? When you put that, you squeeze that bellows, you see how bright that fire gets. That's like the, the fire is like the mitochondria and the oxygen blowing on it, that's coming from your blood cells. And fundamentally at the heart of it, the main way that SARS-CoV-2 does its damage is through wrecking the vascular system and perfusion. So if you're left in a state where you're, you have endothelial dysfunction, small vessel inflammation, and you cannot perfuse tissues well, in other words, you can't offload the oxygen into the tissues to make the mitochondria do their thing, you're going to be in a state of oxygen debt in the tissues and you're gonna be tired and you're just gonna have energy problems. It's, it's functionally like being profoundly iron deficient, anemic, mm -hmm. but you're not, but right. you can't get the oxygen off. And there's been incredible studies on this. Um, even researchers at Yale and Harvard teamed up. That's like the Yankees and the Red Sox making one <laughs> baseball team. You know, they're a little bit uh, competitive with one another, but when long haul started unfolding, there's two researchers, uh, Interjet Singh and David Seistrom, I think, Yale and Harvard guys. And they were two of the only people that had really advanced metabolic testing labs with all the metabolomics, proteomics, but also um, like um, functional pulmonary studies and things like that, PET scans. They basically had everything at their disposal. And they ran exercise physiology and performance type of uh, uh, research, but they applied this to long haulers. And when they looked at how the skeletal muscle of long haulers was performing metabolically, it looked like cardiac tissue with ischemic heart disease or angina or heart attack. Wow. And it had all the metabolic characteristics of it. And they, they list probably about 10 or 12 of those. But some of the big ones were, again, the high lactate levels in the blood and oxygen coming back to the heart or returned blood to the right side of the heart should basically be deoxygenated because it should have left its oxygen in the tissues, delivered it, delivered its payload, got back to the heart to be pumped through the lung to get more oxygen to deliver it again and go around the loop again. The blood coming back to the heart was still full of oxygen. And they, they, they were not 
pumping enough blood, their mitocardia were not working optimally. So the volume of blood they were pumping was lower, but the blood returning was still full of oxygen. And the blood volume that was leaving the heart less than would be expected was coming back to the right side of the heart. The, that, the, one, the blood that came back was oxygenated, but there, some of it was missing. So it's what they call leaky vessel syndrome. We talk about leaky gut syndrome, leaky brain syndrome. Well, these people have leaky vessel syndrome. So the vessels are not in great shape in the small capillary beds, and they're, the, the, the blood is getting out, leaking into the interstitial tissue, but the oxygen is not getting delivered where it needs to go. It's very complicated. It's a, it's a vascular biologist dream or nightmare. I don't know, <laughs> but it, it's, yeah. you know, they're hard at work in the research trying to figure this out for sure. Have you found anything in terms of medications, nutrition, lifestyle, or other interventions that specifically help with this part of it, the vasculature part? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing things that um, are known to help with endothelial dysfunction. So things that lower oxidative stress, um, things that um, also treat what's called the endothelial glycocalyx. So that little kind of slimy carbohydrate mucopolysaccharide layer that kind of these little ciliary looking slimy things that you, you can only see under like electron microscope, very, very thin. But it's almost like the protective slime that keeps the stuff from sticking to the inside of the blood vessels and keep from clotting and kind of protects that one cell lining thick endothelium, which is very, very important to have proper function and produce nitric oxide and, and make all the physiology work right. So that can be degraded in, in an insult like um, SARS-CoV-2, when you get this massive inflammation and all these cytokines running around, you'll get oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, disruption of the glycocalyx. But in long haul syndrome, it seems to be a persistent, not, not as bad as like in cytokine storm and end organ failure and death in acute COVID, but uh, on a lower level, but a persistent type of basis. So we'll use things like there's certain seaweed extracts from monostroma that uh, can treat the glycocalyx, other just mucopolysaccharide uh, type of agents, even things as common as glucosamine sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, all of those molecules, and acetyl D-glucosamine. These can all be helpful. Polyphenols are very helpful. So things like resveratrol, red grape extract, um, even bioflavonoids like quercetin uh, can all be very helpful, not only in the, in, in the context of vascular health, but also in general to lower inflammation and, and do other things that are good in long haul COVID syndrome. But it's not like they undo all the damage. They help, but it's not curative of it at this point. Right. And I want to talk about labs again, going back for a moment. Have you seen changes in, well, we know there are changes in the GI microbiota. Have you seen patterns? There are definitely uh, patterns in the microbiota that we see um, in people with chronic disease in general, but uh, also in long haulers. And you get a shift in the compositional signature of the microbiota more toward an inflammatory dysbiotic state. So we get higher levels. When you look at it, not organism by organism, but at the phyla level, like groupings of organisms, most of the bacteria in the human intestine fall into one or two phyla, the Bacteroidetes or the Firmicutes. And the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes are kind of the competing clans. It's like the Hatfields and the McCoys of the gut. You want to make sure one is not overrunning the other. They're within balance to one another. They all have enough members, but not too many members, but you don't want one to get imbalanced with the other. And that does happen in long haul and just in chronic inflammatory disease in general. You get an elevation of the Bacteroidetes and a lower percentage of Firmicutes. So that ratio shifts and that pushes the whole GI environment toward an inflammatory type of um, environment. So inflammatory cytokines and metabolites from the um, bugs themselves that can upregulate immune function and kind of keep the fire burning of this immune dysfunction. And it happens in autoimmune disease as well. So rather than get kind of hung up on this study showed this specific genus and species of bug higher, and it's really the, the bigger picture. It's a slanting toward an inflammatory bias in the gut. 
You can see changes in keystone commensal organisms like Ackermansia and Fecalobacteria prusnitzii tends to be low, uh, which, you know, these are important things to maintain the, the mucus layer on the lining of the gut so it's healthy. These things make butyrate and other things that keep the gut healthy. So that stuff gets disrupted. And fixing the microbiome and the gut ecology and gut health in general is part of what you need to do in a long hauler for sure. By the way, it was one of the more predictive things of outcomes in acute COVID. People who went into it with a healthy microbiome, not in a dysregulated dysbiotic inflammatory state and not with leaky gut, were much less likely to have a devastating outcome. It wasn't quite as predictive. You know what the most predictive thing was? Vitamin D status. Hmm. Higher vitamin D status was the most shielding thing that's been found yet in the literature. You don't hear about that much in mainstream media, no. but that was, uh, and it was, that was reproduced in multiple countries on different mm -hmm. continents. It wasn't just a local phenomenon. So let's get into some things that you have worked, that you've found in the literature that colleagues have used. We obviously know there's not a one size fits all, but what right. are some of the evidence-based, you know, drug, nutritional lifestyle and complementary yeah. interventions that you recommend? And do you want to also share the personal patient story yeah, well, have. I, have a, I have a lot of personal patient stories because I have a lot of long haul patients because, you know, I'm not only I'm, I'm a functional integrative medicine doc, I deal with complex chronic disorders. So they come to docs like us, usually after a whole bunch of other docs and a whole bunch of other providers. Um, so they're never easy cases. But, um, you know, a big part of my practice also centered in people that had had classic fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue and ME. So because of this similarity and relationship with long haul COVID, obviously the long haulers then started really coming in. And I have a personal story with my wife, uh, my lovely wife, uh, unfortunately is a long haul sufferer for three years. And she got it in that first wave. When she got her acute COVID infection, it was, I think the end of March or very early April, 2020, we were in Connecticut. I'll put it into context. No doctor's offices were open. They were all shut down. Everything was in lockdown. Um, the hospitals were full. Um, and there were cooler trucks outside with dead people in them, right? It wasn't a good time to get really sick. Basically, the last place I wanted her to go to was to a hospital. Because at that point, people were getting kind of rushed into ICU, ventilated, bad outcomes. It wasn't good. So I did everything I could to keep her out of the hospital at home. I mean, I brought oxygen setups and IVs and and uh, hemolumens and uh, blood ozone and everything you can think of from our practice into my house to treat her. And with the help of a couple of colleagues, um, we kept her out of the hospital, but she went on to develop long haul, unfortunately. And she was very typical of a patient that developed long haul, that it became persistent and a big problem in that it was in the spring of 2020, it was that first wave. And she was a former professional dancer, Broadway level dancer, super fit, really good body composition, ate very well. Her nutrition was great. She took lots of supplements. She, I couldn't keep up with her. I mean, she could beat me in an arm wrestle, a leg wrestle, like, you know, going upstairs, whatever. I couldn't keep up with her. Just really metabolically fit. And she's the one that ended up with long haul COVID. And when we looked at this in retrospect, we said, hey, you know, with acute COVID, the predictor of bad outcome was often being overweight, having COPD, having diabetes and hypertension and comorbid conditions, being older. Looked at the long haul patient demographics. Wait a minute. They're younger. They're healthier. And really skewed toward professional athletes, triathletes, dancers like my wife. Why did the fittest among us get long haul syndrome? And there's some really good hypotheses on why. And some of it goes back to that research I talked about at Yale and Harvard. When you look at SARS-CoV-2, it really penetrates into tissues, as most people know by now, through ACE2 receptors. The people who are great athletes, part of the reason they're great athletes is they're really good at onboarding oxygen in their red blood cells, carrying it, and delivering it. They're good at blowing the bellows on the fire. They get more energy out of the same metabolic you know, input that, than average people. And they can stay out of oxygen debt longer. The great bicyclists, like Lance Armstrong was known to have one of the highest 
you know, transport of oxygen known to mankind, right? And it's no no reason, despite all the other things, yeah. <laughs> right? But still, you know, there was a basis yes. of incredible athlete there. So these people have higher density of ACE2 receptors in their vasculature, hmm. and they were better perfusers. They got oxygen into the tissues better. And I think the virus used that in, an, in, in, in a bit of a way. Like their, their fitness and uh, ACE2 receptor density and their perfusion functionality worked against them in this circumstance, which is really odd. Fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. So back to your question, though, what kind of things are we using? What evidence-based things? Well, I'll couch it, first of all, to say all of it has limited evidence because it's so new, right? But doctors started right away trying to use things that made sense based on what we mechanistically knew about SARS-CoV-2 and what it does. And then based on the the symptom profile of what these patients were ending up with and experience with chronic fatigue and ME and and other disorders that have gone before. So you brought up Bruce Patterson. I mean, through his research and through some of his colleagues and group, ended up some of these protocols using off-label drug uh, applications. None of, no drugs have been developed specifically for uh, long-haul COVID, but for instance, there was a cocktail that, that is quite popular still, but was very popular for a while, was using a low-dose statin, um, prevastatin usually, at a pretty low dose, like 10 milligrams. So it didn't usually cause more muscle ache, more mm-hmm. fatigue, right? That's a problem. That's one of the problems with statins. Um, and combined with that drug I mentioned before, Maraviroc, the CCL5 inhibitor, using them in combination. And the, the statin was not being used to lower cholesterol. It was being used because statins have an inherent immune modulating anti-inflammatory component to them, especially in deep tissue inflammation. And they actually worked on a mechanism known as fractaline, um, the fractaline pathway. And, and that is involved in endothelial inflammation and small blood vessel inflammation and damage. So there was a rationale on why those medications were picked, right? And, and, uh, and combined, actually. So this cocktail of lodostatin and maraviroc was used, and some people benefited from, from it for sure. Functionally seemed to get better. Not all, most of them not all better, by the way, but better enough to make a difference. In my, now this is just my personal experience, um, many of them then that, again, that benefit seemed to atrophy over time and they ended up back kind of where they were. And this has happened with other drug interventions. A lot of drugs that were totally for something else have been thrown at this. Fluvoxamine, common SSRI, antidepressant, right? And uh, when you look at it, 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 I think it's a sigma one receptor uh, antagonist. It, it, it's an anti-inflammatory as well. A lot of these drugs have anti-inflammatory effects in addition to what they're known for. And it also affects really deep tissue inflammation. And uh, it seemed to improve a lot of these patients. But again, not all of them incrementally, sometimes not persistently. But I will add that fluvoxamine is unique in the SSRIs. It's not a class effect across all SSRIs. It's only fluvoxamine. Other medications, low-dose naltrexone, which had been used for many years in autoimmune disorders and in, and in immune dysfunction, was used. Um, antihistamines seem to help a lot of the symptoms that long haulers have. Uh, so hydroxazine, beta blockers are used a lot to control the POTS, right? The tachycardia. Um, and anti-anxiety medications, so anxiolytics, even, you know, those in the benzodiazepine class, you got to be very careful with them. But some of these people are so, they're so amped up, insomnia, couldn't sleep, nighttime, like wired and tired type of thing. You see it a lot in them. And if they can't sleep, it's hard to get them better when they right. can't sleep, right? But a lot of them have significant uh, problems sleeping, getting to sleep and staying asleep. They're just in a hypervigilant kind of state, particularly at night, which is they get the tachycardia at night. It's, it's really kind of bizarre. And then uh, just a myriad of other medications have been thrown at it from antibiotics to antivirals, uh, something like acyclovir, for instance. You mentioned like other infections kind of taking the opportunity of the person being down and out with immune dysfunction. And then this other infection that they've controlled for many years that was a stealth infection, let's say Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, 
herpes simplex viruses, Lyme, right. Babesia, all these other tick-borne illnesses, we see flare-ups of those in long-haul syndrome. So not only are they dealing with all the metabolic issues of the long-haul syndrome itself, now they're dealing with this other pathogen taking the opportunity to flare up and cause its own bunch of metabolic mess. So sometimes antiviral drugs have helped certain ones, but you can't throw all these drugs right. at everybody. So you got to kind of triage it, figure out what is the most dominant symptoms and how does a specific patient present and then kind of make your best assessment at what might move the dial on them. And then you have to try it. You have to clinically manage and follow them to make sure they're not suffering any side effects of these things. Uh, and generally they're safe if used right. Plaxovid was another one that was uh, used more in acute COVID to lower the severity and the duration of it. It was thrown at long haul COVID with varying success. What about nutraceutical interventions? Yeah, we use a lot of nutraceutical interventions and some of it is aimed at the mitochondrial dysfunction. So all of the normal suspects of helping energy and mitochondrial function. So anything from nicotinamide riboside to ubiquinone or ubiquinol um, or CoQ10, uh, as many people know it, uh, a molecule called GG or geraniol geraniol works in tandem with CoQ10. High dose L carnitine because of that lactic, the, the fatty acid oxidation problems. So, um, um, L-carnitine will take fats and shovel it into the into the mitochondria to burn more efficiently as energy. So we see high, we talked about metabolomics, you see high uh, metabolites that are, are indicative of fats not being burned in the mitochondria, superate, adipate, ethylmalinate, these other things. So we give high dose L-carnitine. Some of the things I mentioned before when we were talking about vascular dysfunction, yeah. definitely things like an arteriosil or a, you know, a monostroma, these mucopolysaccharides to help the glycocalyx. But these polyphenols work on a multitude of ways from stabilizing the immune system balance to endothelial dysfunction, vascular integrity, uh, gut health. So again, resveratrol, red wine, uh, polyphenol, quercetin, curcumin, luteolin, People use these a lot in nutraceutical intervention, but melatonin is a great immune modulator, high-dose vitamin D. There's nothing yet that's curative. There's things that help us get the patients feeling better, functionally uh, doing well. But if anyone at this point says they have the cure or they have the protocol that cures long-haul COVID, I'd challenge them to put up your objective information that you indeed have that because I haven't seen it yet. And I'm pretty much in touch with most of the big players in long haul, whether it's in research or clinicians. And we're all trying a lot of things and getting some success, but there's nothing that's like universally, oh, this is this is it. Well, there probably won't be, right? Because there's so many- I'm hopeful there will be. Mechanisms, okay. <laughs> I, and here's why. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, for most of my 30 year career in practice, we've I've dealt with so many patients with chronic fatigue and ME and classic fibromyalgia, and chronic Lyme and all these things where conventional, you know, medicine just didn't offer them much, you know, they, they just said, uh, nothing else we can do for you, you know, or take this Prozac, you know, or whatever. Um, back when I first went into practice, they were just overtly discounted and thought of as hypochondriacs and it's all in their head. Give them a, give them a SSRI, you know, give them some Prozac and send them on their way. That changed over time. And then it got more to be, well, we know there's actually something going on and they're really sick, but we don't know what the heck to do about it. So we're not sure what to tell you. But now the numbers are so big with long haul syndrome and it's affecting the economies. It's affecting countries' preparedness. Even military can't. Between the obesity epidemic and long haul COVID, they're having a hard time finding fit enough young people to even serve in the military. That's, that's a matter of national defense urgency, right? That gets the government's attention right? The economic impact certainly gets the government's attention. It also gets pharma's attention and big academic research's attention because there's a lot of government money now. And there's a lot of potential financial reward if you find, if you find the magic pill that cures this. I'm not sure it's going to be quite that easy. But if you find a viable treatment, and at this point, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a pharmaceutical, a nutraceutical. I don't care if it's cobra venom. I don't care if it's <laughs> me doing a rain dance outside my practice. I just want something that helps these people, right? Yeah. But if you get it, 
there's a lot of money in curing it. So with big money opportunities go big money investments into research. I hate to be that cynical, but I've seen it play out like that for 30 years, you know. But I think there's enough research and attention being paid to this at the highest levels that I think there's a much higher chance that you're going to get something coming out of the research pipeline, particularly with all the, all the new science we can do and looking at metabolomics, proteomics, and trying to uncover what underlying mechanistic foundational things that are targets to, to go after. I'm hopeful there's going to be a cure and, and fairly soon. And I'm hopeful when there is, it's not only curative or significantly impactful in improving long haul, but it will also be a big answer for people with chronic fatigue and ME and classic fibromyalgia and chronic symptoms of, of Lyme. Because I really think most of this metabolic wreckage and havoc, this dungeon of bad metabolism that these people fall into, it's a common dungeon. I just think there are different trap doors to get into it. Hmm. There may be variations of it, but I think fundamentally you can get into this mess from having Lyme, from having Babesia, from having, you know, SARS-CoV-2, from having bad Epstein-Barr virus, whatever it may be. So I'm hoping whatever the ultimate therapeutic agent that really moves the dial in these patients, that that positive effect will be conserved across all those patient populations. Yeah. And that would be transformative. That would be, all right, I'll, I'll change my stance to I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, and I can't guarantee that, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm hopeful. I mean, pharma these days, by and large, is not in the business of making things that cure things. They're in the business of making things that manage things. Right. It's a better business model if you have to buy it every month to get the effect, right? If you take it once and it cures you, not that great. There's been some instances of that, you know, in the last bunch of years of, you know, um, hepatitis see uh, treatments, but you know, you saw when they first came out, they were hundreds of thousands of dollars. So. So in the meantime, when you are working with patients, how do you determine, do you do it based on say what symptom is bothering them the most? And then you'll try a few things for that. And then it's partly sequence it that way. It's a lot of things. It's their medical history background mm -hmm. and their, you know, most we can tell about their genetics and lineage and their risk factors. It's any pre-existing conditions they had coming into it. But largely it is the triaging of their symptoms and what's wrecking their life the yeah. most. Um, what variation of long haul do they have, if you will? But also what, what does the data say? Yeah. What do the metabolomics say? What do the proteomics say? What do the gen genetic SNPs say? What, what do the inflammatory markers and the cytokines say? So that, that's definitely a big part of it. But in the end, though, it's still you use all those things to make your best judgment, but then you have to make a therapeutic intervention and the proof's in the pudding. Do they get better? Do they feel different? And we try to not only use, you know, hey, how are you feeling? but objective assessments, repeating right. labs that were abnormal or using, um, you know, questionnaires that have had some validity studies done on them on functionally how they're doing. That's, you know, really important stuff. And we're starting to use with some significant success, you know, regenerative medicine therapies. So we use various injectable peptides, exosomes, stem cells. Some people are doing plasma exchange that's used, you know, even very conventionally in, um, in autoimmune disorders to kind of clean out the blood, if you will, of some mm -hmm. of these antigens that are creating this storm. There's different variations of plasma exchange and amino and, um, and different plasma phoresis. Um, some that's done in the U S some variants done overseas. Patients are traveling a lot to get this treated, to get regenerative therapies that may not be available or yeah. approved in the U S whether they're different types of stem cell treatments, different types of plasma uh, phoresis treatments. And, um, but, and, I, and I've been in contact with a lot of patients who've had a lot of that done. Many of them have gotten better. Some of them have gotten better and there's been a stickiness of the improvement. Others, they slide back or have to keep getting these therapies. Some people don't get better from them at all yeah. and they're not cheap. Yeah. I have one more question about long haul COVID for you. I want to go back to POTS for a moment because yeah. I do get asked about it a lot. Yeah. I know you mentioned the medication part, but what do you do on the nutraceutical side for that? I know I suggest electrolytes. The biggest I know thing is lots thing. of salt and electrolytes and hydration are the biggest. But, you know, a big part of POTS is uh, 
also affected by, um, well, I just mentioned one, hypovolemia, not getting enough hydration, not having enough water volume in the system when you stand up to keep your blood pressure up. Uh, and electrolytes play a big part of regulating that. Most of them need salt, not only electrolytes, but even more yeah. salt in their diet. I probably have cardiologists all over cringing here listening to that because of the hypertension thing, but these people are not hypertensive, they're hypotensive. Um, and um, nutraceutically, uh, adrenal glands have a big part to play, that, that whole right. autonomic response and keeping your blood pressure up, especially when you stand up real quick. So things that improve adrenal function, um, so adaptogenic botanicals. Um, and with these patients, they tend to be in a hypervigilant kind of state. So I tend to use adaptogens that are not overtly stimulating. So instead of like yeah. rhodiola and panix ginseng or Chinese or Korean ginseng, we'll use things like ashwagandha, which is with Annia somnifera. It's a little bit sedating. Uh, American ginseng or panix, uh, um, quinquifolia. Um, we use... Um, German chamomile, um, just just kind of things that are good yeah. for adrenal function. Lots of vitamin C, uh, enough phosphorylated B vitamins, all important. Thank you. Yeah. We love to ask every guest on Conversations of Health some more personal questions. <laughs> so transitioning here, but what are your top three favorite supplements? Oh, top three. Like if I was stranded on a desert island, what sure. would I want yeah. with me? Right. <laughs> that's a difficult one because that puts it in a different context because I'd be worried about getting a cut and getting an infection and things like that. So okay, then no. just living in the day-to-day <laughs> day yes. day world, right? I would say definitely vitamin D because I've just seen too much data on it. It's it's more than a vitamin. You know, it's a hormone. It's an immune right. simulator. It's, it's so important to immune balance and um, bone health and a million other things. I think as of now, we know it interacts with over, you know, 500 gene targets or something like that. So definitely vitamin D. I would probably say overall, I would say some form of fish oil, fatty acid type of thing, just because of its diver it's, it's diversity of effects. You know, it's anti-inflammatory, it's mildly blood thinning. And we didn't get into that, but the whole microclotting vascular oh, yes. end of it. So we use a lot of things like natokinase, seropeptidase, all these different... Uh, kind of natural enzymes that can thin the blood a little bit, almost act like a baby aspirin. Sometimes we need to use stronger anticoagulant agents in some patients based on what the testing says on their bleeding times and other coagulation factors. But things like fish oil can be very, very helpful in that. Uh, so I said vitamin D, fish oil. I don't know. Uh, can I pick a multi, some sort of multi? Sure. Like <laughs> yeah. But nice. a good one. Yes. Yeah. And what are your top health practices for your personal health and well-being? I really think the most important, the two most important things, well, let's say the three most important things, okay, because then I'll land at three. It's got to be eating a good whole fresh food diet. I mean, you can't eat modern junk, junk, garbage in, garbage out, right? And I see a lot of patients make this mistake. You can't exercise and yoga and meditate your way out of a crappy diet. You got to eat real, whole, good foods, and you got to eat a diversity of foods. You got to eat in a decent macronutrient balance. If you just eat a bunch of science foods that you can't pronounce the chemicals on the label, or you know, through convenience foods and and always you know pre-prepared foods, you're just not going to be healthy. So, not that I'm perfect, not that we I don't have my indulgences, but I try to eat real, whole, fresh foods, foods that you could have got in that basic form a hundred years ago. It may not be the same because of the way they grow crops and all that. I get that, but um, organic when I can, but just just whole real food. So that's number one. Number two is sleep. If you can't, if you're not getting enough sleep, but it's not only the quantity of sleep hours, it's the quality of the sleep. So all these wearables and things, I think the biggest advantage into them actually is the sleep metrics. So finding, being able to show people, hey, you're not getting into deep delta wave sleep. You're not restoring yourself at night. You know, you may be sleeping 10 hours, but you're never getting into delta wave sleep. You're not restoring yourself. And what's one of the most common complaints of people with chronic fatigue, long haul, unrefreshed sleep. Mm -hmm. They can sleep 14 hours. They get up, they feel like they didn't sleep. They're not going into delta wave restorative sleep. So they're never restored. So their tissues aren't just, re aren't regenerated. So sleep, good diet, sleep, and then I really, I, it's kind of cliche, I know, but trying to control your stress level and realizing that 
only you have the capability to modulate and control your response to external factors. So like someone else's bad behavior or something they say to you doesn't have to command an unhealthy response from you, you know? And listen, it's hard for me. I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> I'm an Irish guy from New Jersey, you know, it doesn't take much, but as I've gotten older, I've really learned that you really need to, yeah. you're responsible for how you react and control and, and react to external circumstances. And if you just get all mad about everything all the time, it's not good for you. Yeah. You know, you got to put things in perspective. Last question for you. What is something that you've changed your mind about over all your years in practice? Um, I've changed my mind a lot about my ability to be right. Hmm. Care to elaborate on that? I, you know, <laughs> I think doing what we do and kind of being in the position we are, we kind of almost, doctors almost have to have that default ego to that. We're smart. We always know what's right. We'll figure, you know, we'll figure it out and that you need that. And it's important, but it's also important to maintain some humility in it and realize that sometimes you got to just look at it again from a different lens, you know, mm -hmm. that we're dealing with really complicated stuff and it's getting so complicated now with omics and things. You, you can't even all parse it yourself. You got to, I use medical informatics platforms and all kinds of things to chunk up and like use, you know, we're going to be using AI. We already are using AI, but you, you got to humble yourself and check your ego at the door and be able to look. I, I've, I've gone into patients who I've seen for a long time, like really chronic complex injury patients or complex um, um, disorder patients. And I'll go in and I'll put out my hand, shake their hand and go, hello, uh, Mrs. Jones, I, I'm Dr. Smith. And they go, well, I'm not Mrs. I'm not Mrs. Jones and you're not Dr. Smith, you're Dr. Brady. Yeah, but today I'm not Dr. Brady. Today I'm Dr. Smith and you're a whole new patient and we're starting this all over again because what we're doing is not getting you there. Yeah. So, so you, sometimes you just need to you need to talk to a colleague. You need to think that maybe right. I didn't I didn't look at all this right and go back to the beginning. And I think when you're younger and more cocky in practice, you probably don't do that as much. <laughs> I like that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Well, David, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so Likewise. much for your expertise. This was I, I learned so much from you. So thank you for everything that you do. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning into Conversations for Health. Check out the show notes for the resources shared on today's episode. Share this podcast with your colleagues, follow, rate, and leave a review wherever you listen. And thank you for designing a well world with us. This is Conversations for Health with Evelyn Lambrecht, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based cutting-edge research, and practical tips 